these ideas and expressions of things. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks. Well, great. Uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction, uh, Jim. And thanks to Lawrence and Katie for um, opening the, um, the center for us. And we really appreciate that. First things, uh, we'd love to have a regular presence here in the city of Chicago. So, and this wonderful turnout is a sign that there's obviously an appetite for something like this. So, so thanks for coming. There's a lot of office space upstairs that I saw that's available for <laughs> I the, kind of like Chicago, New York City, the Chicago actually, Bureau. At least. The Chicago Bureau, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Christian faith and power politics, Ross. You know, it's our topic tonight. So, why has this become, why has this come to the fore? I mean, I think it's a, I mean, one, it was always sort of at the fore, right? These. These are not entirely new debates. When I started out as a journalist 20 years ago, George W. Bush was president, and everyone left and right was debating compassionate conservatism, evangelicalism's place in American politics. The first piece that I, or the first serious piece, at least, that I ever wrote for First Things was sort of... Well, right. you wrote unserious ones? I wrote, you know, maybe some, <laughs> some juvenilia, right? You know, um, I, it's, hard, it's hard to remember. But I uh, was arguing with people on the left who were themselves arguing that George W. Bush was poised to establish an American theocracy, right? So, so these are not, you know, there are sort of cycles to these debates. They diminish and then come back. But in the current cycle, I think it's a combination of among Christian and especially Catholic intellectuals, a sense of sort of social and ecclesial decline or collapse joined to a sense of sort of political opportunity. So on the one hand, over the last 10 or 15 years, you've had in American life generally a kind of renewed wave of secularization, of people sort of disaffiliating from Christianity and institutional religion, a sort of echo of what happened in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, you've had some very rapid social liberalization that's carried us through the same-sex marriage debates to current debates about transgender issues and everything connected to that. Um, and within Catholicism, you've had sort of, you know, the, the hammer blow of the sex abuse crisis and now I, I think a sort of reckoning with the reality that for the next 20 years, American Catholicism is gonna be dealing with sort of, in, we'll call it institutional consolidation, mm. because that sounds more optimistic, but you know, <laughs> a lot of churches are gonna close, especially in the Northeastern United States where, where I live. Um, a lot, you know, the, the bill is going to come due for declining mass attendance and so on, and declining baptisms and marriages. There's, there's gonna be a big adjustment that looks you know, a, a bit darker than the kind of new springtime of evangelization that people were optimistic about when, when I became a Catholic in the late 1990s. So that's, that's one story, that's sort of a pessimistic story. Um, but then you have this sort of crazy political unsettlement in Western politics, where you know, ten years ago, the United States was you know running the most boring presidential election possible between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. We didn't realize just how boring it boring many it was. Many people are nostalgic for that. Many boring. people, and there you know, there's sometimes I'm nostalgic <laughs> for it. But um, you know, a world where uh, Mark Lilla, who's a you know a famous non-Christian, but sort of very interested in Christianity, public intellectual, wrote a piece around that time basically saying that, you know, he teaches at Columbia and he said, well, when I talk to my students about the great ideological debates of the 20th century, communism and fascism and all these things, I just get blank stares. Like, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Flash forward 10 years and everyone wants to talk about socialism and fascism and everything in between. And, um, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, these disturbances have been strongest on the populist right, but you have similar disturbances to some extent on the socialist left. And I think out of that combination, this sense that 
institutional Christianity and Catholicism have fallen on hard times, but the political is this realm of disturbance, upheaval, and possibility, I think it's totally understandable that you get this, among Christian and Catholic writers, this renewed interest in, well, what, what can we do with politics? Politics is a zone of action and possibility, and maybe it's the lever that we're lacking to reverse, you know, reverse social trends that sort of internal Christian responses haven't succeeded in yet reversing. I don't know. Maybe that's well, a theory, at least. The uh, certainly when first things was founded in eighty nine ninety, our first uh, uh, issue was March of nineteen ninety. There was a kind of, uh, you know, you had the, the three legs of the stool, the free market economy, uh, you know, we were at the very end of the Cold War, it was just ending kind of strong American, you know, military, and uh, a restoration or renewal of the moral culture of the country. Those were the three yep. sort of pillars, right? Strong moral Christian culture, strong, you know, free economy, and then um, muscular foreign policy. Uh, and it seemed like, as I remember those years, that we were all pretty comfortable functioning within the, the kind of orbit of the Republican Party and, to, and pursuing that vision. Uh, but I think, what, I mean, what do you think? It's, it seems like there are lots of, especially younger Catholic intellectuals that are very uh, frustrated with the political options that they inherited yeah i mean i think that again, they that, don't want to they don't want they, they don't want it to be groundhog day all the you know like the movie it's same thing over and over again there's yeah, a sort of well i think there's a perception that it, in effect there was a you know there was a sort of clear religious conservative project mm -hmm. that took something like the form that you describe and saw the Republican Party as a sort of natural vehicle for political but especially moral renewal in American life. And this was supposed to involve sort of ecumenical cooperation of the kind that Newhouse and First Things were deeply involved in between sort of small o orthodox Christians of all of all theological persuasions between you know Protestants and Catholics and Jews and Mormons and Muslims. There was a book uh, by Peter Kreeft that came out that I remember as a teenager called Ecumenical Jihad that came out before 9-11. Um, <laughs> sales were not brisk thereafter. But it, but it was sort of a it was you know it was a late 90s vision, this sense, this sense of of sort of convergences of different strands of conservative religion, um, and, and there was a, a, a sense that certainly runs through Newhouse's writing at the time, in which I was reading as an extremely, extremely lame teenager, um, <laughs> that, you know, basically the problem was this, you know, there was this sort of secularized American elite that was out of touch with the fundamental religiosity of the American people, yes. and this sort of fundamental stability, this sort of religious stability of middle American life could be sort of taken for granted to some extent and harnessed against a decadent elite in order to create a period of political renewal. But, but that, that renewal, that elite level renewal would be founded on this sort of solid, solid core of John Paul II era Catholicism, you know, evangelical Christianity, which then was sort of seemed to be clearly on the upswing, um, and yeah, that was that was sort of the narrative. And for people who are, I, I came of age sort of at the hinge point, mm -hmm. right? So I became a Catholic in 1997, and so I had like three or four years of that sense of sort of late John Paul II era conservative vigor. And then you had the sex abuse crisis break, and then you had the Iraq war that sort of broke the presidency of George W. Bush, which was supposed to be the political fulfillment of this, this sort of religious conservative alliance. Um, and thereafter, and if you were sort of younger than me, you just sort of saw things go bad. 
in various ways, not just in terms of sort of religious trends, but uh, you know, and this this obviously exists in secular forms too. The, you know, the generation that came of age after the financial crisis has very a very dark view of American possibilities, independent of religious questions, relative to people who came of age in the golden sun kiss 1990s. <laughs> um, but that's yeah. The, the, I think there's the core influence on especially younger Catholic would-be intellectuals, but not only them, is this sense that sort of there was a post-1970s project of rebuilding that was supposed to sort of work hand-in-hand -hand with some of the preoccupations of the Republican Party, and it all came to grief over the last 20 years. And so the question is, how far back do you go to figure out what went wrong? And right. some people, you know, as Jim alluded to, want to go all, you know, you can you can go back to the 60s, or you can go back to the American founding. William or, of Ockham. Or William of Ockham. Right? I mean, this is, the, this is the perpetual conservative project, right? Yes. In 1950s conservatism is just people arguing about whether it was the 13th century or the 16th century where things, right. things really, really took a wrong turn. But you, you get those arguments. I've always said sense. it's really Adam and Eve. That's Ad, really that, things well, that took is a the, wrong That turn. is probably a like Chestertonian <laughs> answer. <laughs> Right, but but yeah. So there's, I think there's a deep, a deep sort of assumption of pessimism. But then again, weirdly, so if you if we'd had this conversation six, let's say six years or pre-Trump, right, pre-Brexit, pre-populism, you'd have this conversation and you'd say, okay, this pessimism is going to feed into a kind of quietism and withdrawal from politics. Well, you got Rod Dreher, right. Benedict, Benedict Option, Option, which is before Trump. Right, and it's we're all going to be Mennonites and uh, you know, sort of, you know, the the at best, we can hope to be Mormons, but otherwise, we'll be the right. old order Amish. And then, but then politics comes along and says, well, wait, you know, actually, you know, crazy things could happen. And I think that creates a pivot that you can see in, you know, in Rod. I mean, the, the sort of yes. Rod, our, our mutual friend, Rod Dreher's turn from, and, you know, he would argue there's, you know, perfect coherence. Right, all right, of this, right? right. You know, all, all, there are, there are a million false interpretations of the Benedict Option, right? But, um, <laughs> but, but you know, he, he obviously he wrote a book urging Christians to sort of effectively rebuild their own institutions and focus less on politics. But then subsequently, he has become a great champion of Viktor Orban and certain right. sort of populist, nationalist, conservative tendencies. And I think that is that turn is understandable given how the political ground shifted under people's feet in the last decade. Well, there's another trend here, and it kind of gets us into the more theoretical side of things. I mean, I would say before Trump, you, I think you're accurately described in New Housian, you know, the secular elite control the commanding heights of culture, and if we would just uh, release their grip on the levers of power, the natural religiosity of the American people would bubble to the to the, to the top. But what actually seems to have happened in the last 10 years is that uh, Christianity, especially a certain kind of Catholicism, has actually turned out to be very attractive to you know, very well-educated, super ambitious young people. I, mean, I just remember going to Washington, D.C. in 2012, 2013. It's like everywhere I turned around, it was some kid who went to Christendom College, not Christendom College, but Liberty University, who was entering the Catholic Church. So there, there seems to also be an intellectual trend, a, a top-down, not a bottom-up, which is kind of the so-called integralist uh, 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 vision. Right. There's a sense in which political Catholicism is sort of the, there's a looking for your keys where under the lamp, lamplight, you yes. know, sort of thing. It's like, well, what kind of what kind of power and influence do we have? Well, there is a lot of Catholic federal judges, right? Like, that's a, you know, that's, and uh, so that, I think. But would you agree? I mean, I guess this has been a big, Yeah, I, I mean, think I in think, the last decade, it's been really quite striking to me how many yeah, I have a young friend, people in DC, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the kind of the people who make the government work. I mean, they're staffers on Capitol Hill. And or not make government work, but they write a lot of legislation, at least indirectly, if the lobbyists right. aren't. And uh, and I just was a little kind of flabbergasted at their interest in a very traditionalist kind of uh, Catholicism. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that Pius again, the there's always there's <laughs> always been I mean, the the phenomenon of evangelical kids who become Catholics in college is a like decades old yeah, sure, I agree. cliche. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has both. I mean, on the one hand, it's striking that it, it has continued under a papacy that's very different from certainly the the Benedict Benedict the Sixteenth papacy, right? I had sort of wondered if, you know, the shift in sort of the Vatican's relationship to liberal modernity, and there has been some kind of shift under Francis, would sort of, you know, make the church less attractive to a certain kind of conservative kid looking for a bulwark <laughs> against modernity. Again, I'm talking in cliches that describe many of my dear friends, so, you know. Um, but instead, it's only in certain ways, it seemed to accelerate, I would say. And I, yeah, I have a friend who works in a DC think tank, and he says, yeah, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, um, you know, the, the young people, there were, you know, there were conservative Catholics and a handful of conservative Jews, and a, but also a bunch of sort of libertarian Rand Paul fans. And now he's like, yeah, it's all Catholic integralists, you know, as our, you know, as our interns and, and so on, plus, of course, the occasional Nietzschean, right? Like that's the other, the sort of. Now don't 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 laugh. Um, you know. The, no, I agree. The there there's a, there is also a sort of a revival of a kind of anti-Christian conservatism, or you know that again is not incredibly potent, but has some has some purchase. Uh, as well, yeah. I agree, I agree. Well, let's drill down with this integralism business um, because this is the topic of, not the topic, but this is a, um, one of the themes of the, your contribution in our, in our um, June-July issue and your exchange with Edmund Waldstein. Um, I mean, you know, Waldstein, what does he say here? He says, political life too must submit to God. And in, a, in the abstract, that seems uncontroversial. You know, St. Paul says to, about, about uh, Jesus that to him every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And so what, I mean, so in abstract, that's, so what, what like where is the, where's the friction point? Where's the, where's the, where's the controversy? Where's the, where's the disagreements? Where are the debates? I mean, would I mean, you agree with that statement that, some, it, it, to some sense, uh, every Christian says that we're all integralists in the end? <laughs> right, and the point of friction is, you know, I mean, it, it's it's sort of certain ways boringly obvious to say that it's the Inquisition, but it kind of is the Inquisition, right? It is. It is the question of to what extent is you know, is the goal of a Christian society served by the coercive power of the state being used to regulate Christian belief, right? And that's, and that's sort of a, in certain ways, a very antiquated sounding question. Um, but it's a question that sort of, if, if you want to say, as some younger, not only younger Catholics want to say, right, that this sort of, the church made an unwise accommodation with liberal pluralism, let's say, mm -hmm. in, the, in the 20th century, right? Um, then, you know, you, you are saying in, to some degree that the, there is a coercive power over the faithful that, and I'm saying over the faithful because, you know, a good, a good integralist would say that the church doesn't have coercive power over non-Christians, but it has coercive power over baptized Christians that was a feature of Western Christendom in various ways for hundreds and hundreds of years um, that was shattered and or given up over the course of the 19th and 20th century. Um, and that to some extent, to some degree, that is what the church is missing in its efforts to reverse its own decline. And then, you know, then you get the, the, the next order question is, well, what do we mean by 
right coercion. And of course, there's this you know it's incredible a, it's a, range it's from a, it's a it's a Torquemada to the to blue laws, right? right? And and where you leave where you leave the sort of American pluralist tradition for integralism is itself an open question, right? Like right. there are there are people who you know there are sort of secular liberals who would say that a state having blue laws is integralist, right? I've, I've been accused of You've that by right. arguing for blue laws. Sweet right. prayer. I would right. like to see the Supreme Court cases from the 60s overturned so that if the people in North Dakota want to start their school day with some bland ecumenical prayer, they can do it. Right. And this has earned me denunciations as, you know, uh, an integralist. Right. And so the que in certain ways, the question is, are the... You know, there's a bunch of different labels you can give this tendency. Are the is the new right, the post liberals, the integralists, are they arguing for reconsidering all of American history and and sort of returning Catholic ideas to a landscape where you know you would defend a really close relationship between church and state, or are they just sort of using more radical rhetoric to rediscover what was just sort of bog standard religious conservatism 40 or 50 years ago, which is what, if you're for school prayer, blue laws, abortion restrictions, and, you know, sort of public rhetoric with a sort of Christian tint, you're not an integralist. You're an American religious conservative from 1977 or 1997, for that matter, right? Um, and this is sort of where I think these debates get a little slippery because the integralists don't want to say that they want to bring back the Inquisition, generally. They want to say, well, you know, some mistakes may have been made in the application of, and, and Waldstein says this in mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in, our, in our first things debate, but they also want to say that just going back to 1970s or 1990s era religious conservatism is not enough, that you need something, you need a more radical philosophical break with liberal modernity. And so I think the open question is, what does that, you know, what, what does that actually mean, right? Well, maybe we'll put it this way. I mean, we, I mean, the former President Obama, diversity is our strength. Pluralism is a positive good. Uh, John Stuart Mill, Marketplace of Ideas. We have, we've inherited a lot of liberal rhetoric, I'll call it liberal rhetoric slogans, that do, do seem to be fundamentally incompatible with Christian faith. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that Newhouse would have been delighted if more people you know, believed in Orthodox Christianity and there was a stronger and stronger consensus within the country. So he didn't think that religious pluralism was good well, it's obviously a fact, but it wasn't a good. And it seems as though if you're willing, if you're a, if you're a young person or, a, or an older person like me and say, well, you know, it would be better if everybody was Catholic, the country would be better off and we would be more unified and we would be less prone to error, gross error, in terms of our body politic, our, our, our policies. Then, then everything turns on how you get to that supposed ideal. That I, well, it's not supposed. It's an, it is an ideal. Right, but you could you could also say that, you know, this is this is where the the integralists hurl wet cabbage at my you know New York Times columnist temporizing. Right, but you could also <laughs> say that we have you know several hundred years of an American, of the American experience of being a vast continental empire on a scale that, you know, no pre-modern society approach, just in terms of sort of population size, to say nothing of internal diversity. And on the basis of that experience, you could say, yes, there is a degree of sort of religious unity and uniformity that has been that is good for America and as Catholics you and I would say you know the ideal version of that religious center that sort of religious common ground should be Catholic but there is also a degree beyond which it is 
maybe not impossible on an eternal time scale, but extremely difficult on the human time scale to push that uniformity without sort of just having it automatically either overreach or founder. No, right? I agree. There's a question. Then, it's a, then it all turns on questions of prudence. I mean, so if, if, if we agree that the, the country would be better if, if Catholicism were, you know, sort of the overwhelming option and our political culture was profoundly influenced by it, then it's a question just of how to get there. And, and you might, I mean, I agree with you. You might say, look, given the nature of our country and our political traditions and our history, uh, we, however we try to get there, it has to be within the framework of the First Amendment. But that's not up for, it's not going to get repealed anytime soon. Right. I mean, the question of, there's, and yeah, the, the question of how House actually temporized in that space. Because he was always very clear, he kind of wanted everybody to come into the church. Right. Oh, yeah. well, on, New House, you probably saw him lean on people. Why are you not coming? New, I mean, <laughs> New House is, under current terms of debate, more integralist than the sort of narrative of a you know, sort of liberal conservatism, you know, the, the, place, the place that would be assigned to him in those narratives would, would be. Um, but right, but then, the, but, but how you get there is, is also sort of, you know, the, the it, it's not an incidental question, right? Like, it's, no, it's because, a, it, because, I mean, because the debates were having in this zone are debates about what, you know, to what can political power reasonably hope to accomplish, right? What, what can you accomplish if you control the Supreme Court with some of those, you know, Catholic lawyers, right, that I was mentioning? What can you, what can you accomplish if you control the federal bureaucracy with a generation of Catholic administrators currently being trained by Adrian Vermeule, right? Um, what, you know, what, what can you accomplish if, like Victor Orban, you look at sort of the blob, right, the sort of liberal establishment, and you say, well, we can build our own version of that. Like, how far does that get you before you, well, one, can that alone create social transformation from below? And how far can you get with it before you need something else happening from below that looks, you know, more like how Christianity you know, grew in second century Rome, not Constantinian Rome, right? Like, you know, do you need, what, what can a Constantinian Catholicism accomplish? Um, well, I think to put the Remulian hat on and, and, and play the devil's advocate here, Adrian's position, uh, Angela yeah. Angel's advocate, I mean, you can't, you can't presume. Yeah, that's true. Sure. Sure. The yeah, devil's well. party. So he would, um, I think you would, if you look at my lifetime, uh, I guess control of a lot of these, control of the instruments of political power, which are multifaceted, as you say, administrative, uh, judicial, legislative, um, they've, had, they've had a tremendous uh, capacity to transform our society. Like, I, I, I think, like I said, I think getting rid of school prayer had a big effect on our culture. And that was not something that came by popular demand. Uh, there was a lot of apathy out there, don't get me wrong. Obviously, people were willing to accept it. But had it persevered, uh, I, I, and that was at a time of peak homogeneity in our society, 1962. So do you I, think, do you, I mean, I, so I, I think in a, I'm not sure. in a conversation <laughs> with... If we were, if I was having a conversation with David French, for instance, to take someone who takes a more thoroughgoingly liberal view yes. of what I would, I would argue your perspective and say, you know, you're understating the effects that sort of a single act of judicial power can have. But since you're wearing Adrian Vermeule's hat right now, I will say, are you sure it had that big an impact? Right. No, so I'm if you sure. look, we just watched a you know a huge state funeral in the UK. Yes. Right. Set about with all the trappings and symbolism of an established church that has never been disestablished. That at the same time, you know, the Supreme Court was ruling against school prayer, was holding you know an intensely Christian 
globally broadcast coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, right? Um, you know, England still has Lord Spiritual. It still, it still has things that the U.S. Supreme Court, in their attenuated mainline Protestant form, did away with here. And I mean, has that made any difference well, to secularization in yes, England? Yes, but I think you but can... it, part of the evidence here is that you know, uh, Rabbi Sachs, Jonathan Sachs, and and other dissenting Protestants, non-Anglican Protestants, are absolutely at, you know. They do not want disestablishment because they they anticipate that it will actually knock the pins out from underneath whatever is left of English religiosity. Now again, right? But I don't so, think you so can, I, I, I don't think you I can find prove that, the one way or the other. I find that totally persuasive, right? But so, but there's a dynamic effect here, right? So like, take take same-sex marriage, right? So the Obergefell decision clearly knock the pins out, as you say, from residual re re well, resistance. And, and sort of resistance to the next phase of cultural liberalism, right? You know, had Obergefell not been decided as it was, I don't think sort of the politics, the cultural politics around gender transition would have accelerated in anything like the same way. I think that's right. But what was the push for same-sex marriage sort of invented and imposed by the elite by I mean not exactly it was accelerated by it but in fact you know trends in public opinion generally preceded the major court decisions there you know again there's a dynamic process here but it was pretty clearly the outworking of a multi-decade trend that was forged by the contraceptive pill, the interstate highway system, the rise of mass <laughs> media. I mean, seriously, like sure. the structural underpinnings of the sexual revolution. And I mean, there's a reason that the sexual revolution happened in different forms in just about every non-closed society around the world, right? You can't just say it was, you know, if you put some decent Catholic lawyers on the Warren court, it wouldn't have happened, right? And it just seems to me that 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 fundamental social reality at some point you have to you have to have a a response to it as catholics and as christians that it's fundamentally missionary rather than political and so the question is what you know what politics creates necessary preconditions for that missionary work i, I think that's a a reasonable question where the tug from the integralist is correct. There are more things you can do in politics than are exhausted by Paul Ryan's form of, you know, Catholic conservatism in that 2012 election I mentioned, right? But the idea that, you know, that the idea that sort of political power can just summon, can summon mass attendance back or something, I th I'm, I'm deeply skeptical of I that. take a more pedestrian rather than g grand view of it. It strikes me that the magistrate has a duty to protect citizens from dangerous falsehoods um, and destructive, self, you know, destructive influences. This is why I, I find it, I'm just flabbergasted by the movement to legalize marijuana. Um, which again is not a grassroots movement, but is actually an elite-driven movement. Um, it's extremely popular. Like pop. I mean, I, I think. So to speak, right. No, I, I completely. I completely. I, 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 I one thousand percent agree with you about but I, but the, about I, I, this. But but but, we, but we if did, you look at public it, opinion, well, right? We got like it in New York, and has, I don't think it would have passed if it was a if it was a referendum. I mean, because people, yes, and it's like pornography. And people say everybody's so it's so widespread you could never regulate it. I think no, actually, uh, people people yes people know they're weak, they're aware. Do they want it to be regulated out of existence? Maybe not. Would they like it to have a lot more regulated than it is now? Yes. I, I think I actually think pot and, and pornography are slightly different cases. With pornography, you can see in polling strong stronger than you might expect residual opposition. Like it, it's become more socially accepted. But there are still lots and lots of people willing to say it's bad, it should be regulated, it's morally wrong, relative to some other, you know, sex-related issues. 
with pot, the swing is just much stronger and has outrun legal change. Like more, the, the you know, we're, we're at basically sort of 65, 35 marijuana should be legal and it's still illegal in lots, in lots of states. Mm. Um, now, I, I agree. I, th I, I think... I think a, a f I think a responsible elite could shift that opinion to some degree, and it's obviously not something that is, you know, it, it doesn't have the kind of pot in part in pot in part <laughs> because of the nature of the constituency for marijuana, you know, mass mobilization is somewhat challenging um, around around the issue, but. But there, I do. I, I don't know. I, I think that is a case where, at the very least, sort of resistance to the idea has collapsed at a speed that exceeds the actions of the politicians trying to profit from its legalization. Uh, I don't know. Well, but the whole woke business. I mean, if if the if, the, if it's a duty of uh, those who legislate to protect citizens from dangerous falsehoods. <laughs> then to some extent, the people who want Twitter and Facebook to engage in all this censorship, their intuition is not, is not incorrect. However misguided what they think counts as dangerous might be, or however overzealous they might be unwise in terms of trying to do with censorship what cannot actually be accomplished. Sometimes it just makes things worse. Right. But the basic, so maybe, we're, we're coming out of a phase where we told ourselves lots of liberal myths that were just unsustainable, like the idea that we could have a neutral, uh, a neutral culture or that we could have neutral laws or we could um, only have legislation that had to do with you know, our material interests and not our, yes, not our I, spiritual no, I, interests. I, 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 think that, I think that the a theory of American political history that places sort of liberal neutrality or John Stuart Mill's principles at the center of our national story is basically incorrect. And that there was sort of an unusual moment in American history connected where, you know, the, the Protestant mainline collapsed as a kind of centering moral force in American life. and. There wasn't anything, there's, there still isn't completely, but at that moment there really wasn't anything to take its place. And there was a strong impulse towards personal liberation and personal freedom. And out of that, there was sort of this, this kind of retcon narrative that, oh, oh, you know, we've always been, we've always been sort of, you know, First Amendment absolutist, procedurally neutral liberals. And that, that tradition has always been sort of a, minority disposition in American life, a sort of elite level phenomenon that doesn't have tons of purchase. And yeah, I mean, part of, and it's somewhat different from, I think that the forces driving, say, acceptance of marijuana are not sort of liberal neutrality. They're kind of hedonistic despair, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a different, maybe they're connected, but they're, they're a different, different kind of Kind of force, um, but yeah, what you see with wokeness is a more natural reassertion of the American tradition of you know meddling Protestant busybodies, right? Like right. that's that's American, man, right? right? You right. know, um, and and it's and but it also has. I mean, I tried to make this argument, maybe or maybe not persuasively in first things, but but that that sort of progressive pseudo religiosity runs into the same limits that a would-be, you know, religious conservative or even integralist force would run into, right? Which is that, you know, America's a big and diverse country. And it turns out that, yes, you can take the strange ideas of the academy beyond the academy. You can put them in corporate HR departments. You can put them in second grade curricula. Like, they can expand, but they also hit resistance pretty pretty quickly. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical of the idea that a kind of, you know, sort of woke, woke totalitarianism or something can carry it, carry all before it for the same reason that I'm skeptical that Catholic integralism can sort of, you know, redirect America from, if it only captures the, 
the bureaucracy. Um, I could, you know, I, I, even something like the, the COVID experience, right, where, um, you know, the, the United States entered a global pandemic and, you know, the, the immediate response, really immediate, including from one Rusty Reno in the pages of First Things, was a really strong assert, reassertion of a certain kind of, you know, I don't want to call you a libertarian, Right, but like the, you know, a sort of a, a very American resistance to overweening centralized authority. Right, like that is. Mm, I would say it was a resistance to the idea, which we were told that dying is the worst possible thing. Right, it was a Christian resistance, not a libertarian resistance. That's that's fair. <laughs> I, I said I wasn't accusing you <laughs> as libertarian, <laughs> but, but but that I mean you. You know, but let's go back to the integralism thing. It seems to me that that we the the conservative political forces in America have over the last twenty years actually worked very hard to create a more congenial environment for religiosity, and on two fronts. One is that the Supreme Court has been extremely solicitous of uh, 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 religious liberty. And secondly, the real transformation of attitudes in the Republican Party towards funding of uh, religious, uh, re private religious yep. education. And so, for instance, this new Arizona bill is really quite extraordinary. And Maine is a, was the one in the courts that uh, also advanced things, and then Montana. So I guess, that, again, I'm back to the, uh, the Vermeulean. There's something to this that this will make a difference. This will make it. I mean, I'm with you. Yes. Well, well you can't yes, use political but, power to create the second great awakening or the third great awakening is what we need. But you can use political power to actually make it easier to transmit your faith to your children. That is yes. to say, by giving you ten or twelve thousand dollars a year to spend on private education. Yes, but the. I mean the. But the argument for but the argument I mean making not, not homeschooling to, more easy not to go too far down the rabbit hole right but the the argument the the horrifying rabbit hole of intra intra Christian you know <laughs> so much arguments fun, right but but you know the argument you just made is not the Vermeulean argument that's the David French argument David French says why are you integralists in despair look at all these victories for religious liberty no, I agree there's won. a lot of and the integralists say but over this period. You know, actual There's lots religious of blind practice armies has, clashing at night has debate. declined, right? So the integralists are implying that you need to go further than the sort of permission slips in religious liberty. But I mean, but maybe the reality is that even now, like clearly, the most sort of socially promising force for the future of any kind of conservative Christianity in this country is probably like some combination of homeschooling and classical Christian education, right? And so you can tell a story where you have the political preconditions for that created by a friendlier, friendlier courts and friendlier politicians, but you need, um, you know, you still need sort of the, the actual parents and teachers and school builders and everything else on the ground. You need that missionary spirit. And the quest, I, again, again, then the question is, well, is that enough, right? Is it enough to have a government that makes it easier for you to raise your kids as Christians? And then that leads to, you know, it creates a space for a renaissance and in institution building. Or is that not enough because the weight of, you know, the weight of cultural institutions, the weight of liberalism and, you know, every every other area is so powerful. I think that's sort of the one way of framing the, the question at, at the moment, right? And the, I think the integralist position is it's not enough, right? It's, it's nice, but what you really need is for the government to, for the government of Arizona to just make every public school, I mean, a classical Christian school, right? Like, that's, that's what you really need to do well, well, I guess with, whatever, with whatever care and caution along the way. All right, we want to leave time for, for questions, but a final prompt here, a final question. 
why in 2022 would blog posts calling for the empire of Our Lady of Guadalupe evoke such sort of outrage and terror almost in, 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 in the chattering classes? What is it about our moment that feels, why, why does it feel so fragile? Such that, I mean, I mean would it, that like, would not I mean, have, got, I guess, I guess that, I guess that we, all we need to do is look at our political culture. <laughs> I mean, I think that it depends which part of the political culture you mean, right? But within Catholicism, the dynamic that you're describing vis-a-vis -vis Washington think tank certainly obtains within the Catholic Academy, right? You, you and I both know many older Catholic professors who are very comfortable as, let's say, Catholic neoconservatives who voted for George W. Bush, who have students who are reading Adrian Vermeule mm -hmm. and trying to rehabilitate aspects of 19th century Catholicism. And so that, just in terms of internal Catholic debates, that kind of sense of like, well, what's happened to the younger generation? Why are they embracing these wild seeming ideas? That, you know, that joined to a younger generation that's like, oh, you old fuddy-duddies, you know, you still like Ronald Reagan, you know, what's up with that, right? Like that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a real dynamic. And then in our politics, writ large, you know, we, there, there, there has, there is obviously a sense among liberals that, you know, something has gone wrong with the arc of history, right? That, you know, you were, we, we were supposed to head towards an ever more sort of European Union style of politics. And now the European Union is filled with, you know, Chesterton quoting, yes, right? Yes. Like, you know, prime ministers from parties with fascist pedigrees, right? Like that, that was not, obviously not supposed to happen. Um, and so there is, you know, you can tell a version of the story that we've been sort of batting back and forth about the world of secular liberalism, like the, yes. the, the equivalent of the George W. Bush voting Catholic professor horrified by their integralist student is the, you know, sort of free speech oriented Obama voting liberal horrified by both Donald Trump and their own, you know, illiberal seeming woke left wing colleagues or students or what have you, right? Like th this general sense of sort of sudden disturbance of a world that was assumed to be tending in a political direction is not just a Catholic or Christian or conservative phenomenon, it's, it's, it's present in all kinds of, in all kinds of institutions. So right we're now. living at the end of the end of history. Well, that's, we'll have to get into that in the <laughs> Q&A. I mean, I think the end of history is, is is resilient to a degree that you, it will not be overthrown by Substack posts about the empire of Guadalupe. Well, could, could I, let me reinforce that. I read Vladimir Putin's speech from a couple of days ago, and it, it is full of accusations as the West discriminates, that our attitude towards Russia constitute a kind of a racism, uh, that we're neo-colonial. It's really fascinating the way that essentially the modern liberal sins are hurled back uh, on, onto the West, which would reinforce your point. At the end of the end of history, is actually hard to get to. Well, and it's hard to get to <laughs> if you can't, you know, if you're, I mean, the, like the world is more, it is both true that the world, that America is weaker internationally than it was 20 years ago, and the world is more multipolar, and in that multipolar world, you know, India is more Indian, China is more Chinese, and Russia is more Russian than you would have predicted in 1999. That's true. It's also true that, you know, Russia, I mean, Russia can't conquer Ukraine, right? Like the great, the great rival to the United States is unable to reconstitute even a piece of its Cold War era empire. These the rival poles to America are not, they're stronger than they were 20 years ago, but weaker maybe than they would need to be to truly usher well, in some new My point is, is that Western modernity has 
affected the entire globe. Yeah. And so China, Russia, Iran, India are a lot more Western than they were 20 years ago, even as they're more frustrated and truculent and willing to uh, counter uh, American power. Yeah, so I we mean, are in a very odd time. There's some, there is de-Westernization in the sense that, like, you know, Hindutva ideology in India is less Western than the Congress Party, right? And, you know, China has, you know, closed itself off to American movies in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, there, mm -hmm. there is some attempt. But then, yeah, did you watch the... Uh, in one of the big rallies that Moscow staged, right, after one of Putin's recent speeches, you know, they had, they had a concert and it was, you know, Russian pop stars singing a Russian language version of the sea shanty meme, you know, yeah. that was big yeah. on YouTube. Yes. 18 months ago. And right. it's right. It's like, yeah. that's, yeah, that's the point you're making. It's yeah. very weird. All right, let's, uh, let's take some time for uh, questions. Now we've ended on weird. Uh, so if people want to, uh, we have a microphone somewhere, yes? Uh, hello, Ben Conroy, University of Chicago, thank you both very much. Um, I have a question. We, in a lot of the developments in Catholic politics, Christian politics over the last few years, there's a lot of really interesting thinking. Um, the idea that status quo needs to be changed in these fundamental ways. Or I often see that thinking foundering is falling into maybe two gravitational wells. The wells of being nuts and the well of being um, just <laughs> a useful servant of the establishment, right? And when I say nuts, I don't mean kind of, you know, oh, you know, how far can coercion go before it's illegitimate? I mean like, you know, crazy COVID conspiracies or out and out racism or just, you know, it's so easy for people to slip off the edge into property nut stuff. And then the response to that is often people say, I want nothing to do with that. And they go and they're like, well, you know, actually, Joe Biden isn't so bad, you know. Uh, mass abortion, let's not worry about it too much. And so what I'm wondering is, I, as a result of all this, I've just become very pessimistic. Uh, I see a lot of these revivals or attempted revivals foundering in one of these ways or the other. And I wonder if either of you have any thoughts on ways to avoid the kind of skill and carrot this um, pattern that I think we keep seeing. How not to go nuts. Yeah, I mean, one, I think that obser I think, yeah, I think that observation is broadly correct. And there's a sort of, you know, while and one level, conservative Catholicism is having these slightly abstract debates, yeah, about, you know, what, you know, Catholicism's relationship to liberalism. At another level, definitely, there's been a slide, uh, you know, a, a slide into different forms of paranoia, related forms of paranoia, some of them sort of in certain ways, understandably conventional fears of one world government and so on connected to the COVID pandemic, some of them connected to internal church politics where, you know, uh, sort of skepticism and criticism of Pope Francis, which I, of course, have participated in at various <laughs> points, has curdled in a lot of places into, yeah, just sort of out, outright, um, out, outright craziness. Um, and then, yeah, we haven't really talked about liberal Catholicism or left Catholicism in this discussion being two flavors of conservative Catholic. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the dilemma for certainly what you might call moderate liberal Catholicism uh, has been, you know, well, what is what is what does Joe Biden Catholicism offer that is in any way different from a secular liberalism? Right, like, and is there a point where secular liberalism is going that liberal Catholicism can't accommodate itself to and follow? Right, whether it's you know euthanasia over here, just sort of gender-related issues over there. You know, they, there's the, I think the fall of of um, the fall of Roe was really telling, right? Because in certain ways, 
the return of abortion politics to the democratic process should have been an opportunity for a kind of seamless garment liberal Catholicism to sort of have its moment and say, okay, here we're here to offer the abortion compromise, right? And there were some people who wrote things along those lines, but there's just no political purchase. Like there's no one in the modern Democratic Party, that, you know, which includes many practicing Catholics who is there. Anyway, I'm just sort of agreeing with you without offering a solution. I'm sorry. But it was a very good it was a very good point. And it brought up again things we, we didn't we didn't exactly discuss. I mean, I then the advantage of having my unusual position of being a conservative Catholic columnist at a liberal newspaper is that I my job requires me to um, sort of always be questioning, you know, sort of tribal pulls of, of various kinds. Um, that's sort of a, a privilege of what is otherwise a somewhat stressful vocation. But that, I mean, but that is fundamentally the, the thing, right? You don't want to let your, you don't want to assume that all good things and all, that all bad things go together. And if, you know, like with, with, um, how many people know who Eric Metaxas is? It's a lot of hands, right. So I've known Eric Metaxas since I was 11 years old and he watched Jeopardy uh, on my parents' couch in, in New Haven back when we were evangelicals. Um, and Eric, Eric at some point in the COVID era, you know, decided that essentially all, all possible evils were aligned within liberalism and liberalism had stolen, it was not enough for liberalism to be too pro-abortion, too sexually libertine, too, you know, the, the sort of usual religious conservative critique. Liberalism had also stolen the election from Donald Trump, imposed a poisonous vaccine that was killing large numbers of people, and so, and so on and so on, right? Um, and, you know, without arguing out any of those particular positions, I think the assumption that your enemies are, that everything your enemies are doing is equally bad and it's all part of the worst imaginable horror that the human race has ever faced is usually a mistake. Not always. And Eric wrote a book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his, you know, that, that framework obviously looms very large in his thinking. But most of the time, your enemies are really wrong about two things, but they might be right about something else. And keeping that in mind is a really important way to try and stay sane in a landscape as weird as the one Rusty and I have been discussing. Thank you. Um, I stand really far away. Uh, thank you guys both so much for being here. I wonder if you could help me sort something out. So integralists are obviously kind of hitching their wagon to the populist movement right now. And populism and nationalism seem to go hand in hand these days. But so on one hand, the integralists are very nationalists, you know, close the borders, bring the boys home, uh, you know, forget international trade, all of that. But at the same time, a lot of their rhetoric isn't America first, it's blame America first. So I was wondering if you could kind of square that circle. Are the integralists actually nationalists? Are they, you know, or are they just anti-nationalists? These are the deep cuts. These are the really, you know, this is, this is, this is a big crowd and I know you're all here for like the, the really fine distinctions between <laughs> national conservatives and post lib anyway, but to, to try and answer your question, I, I, I think that the, the, the one key distinction is that um, people in, who are more in the integralist camp, which would include 
your former colleague Matthew Schmitz and frequent First Things contributor Sora Bamari, right, who together run Compact, Compact Magazine, an online journal that publishes a lot of really good stuff. I, I recommend it. Uh, they have a sort of, they, they, fundamentally they have a vision of deep realignment in Western politics where the, the best of the right and left are going to unite and totally reject um, sort of all forms of mainstream establishment politics. And so, you know, that means rejecting just the idea of America as like the world superpower, right? That idea is, is going to be rejected. We are going to, um, you know, we, we are going to sort of, reje you know, reject militarism in all its forms, which means, you know, if China wants to take Taiwan, we're not going to get in a war over Taiwan. If Russia wants to take Ukraine, we're not going to get in a war over Ukraine. We are going to focus on rebuilding our own society with some combination of more left-wing economics and social and religious conservatism. That's sort of the more radical vision. Then the populists, the national conservatives and so on have some overlap with that, right? They don't want to have military adventures overseas. They don't want to do the Iraq war again. They don't want to do nation building. They also are open to some sort of left-wing coded ideas. They're open to industrial policy, you know, building up America's industrial capacity, all these things. But they just aren't as radical. So they they maybe don't want to support Ukraine all the way, but they do probably want to fight for Taiwan, right? They don't want to give up on American global power entirely. They want to manage it more effectively. Similarly, they want to do a little more industrial policy, but they aren't going to go all the way to sort of left-wing views on economics. They don't love Bernie Sanders and so on, right? So the 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 national conservatives are they represent this ongoing tendency in Republican politics that I have been part of through my entire professional career of basically looking at the Republican Party and saying, do you really just have to do tax cuts on economic <laughs> policy? Can't you be a little more Catholic, you know, a little more sort of solidarity oriented? But in the end, they're still going to be in the Republican coalition, right? They're going to sort of work with it. And the same thing on foreign policy, whereas the more the more radical vision is to say, if the Republican Party is just, you know, it's always going to do a tiny bit of family policy and a lot of tax cuts, then to hell with the Republican Party, right? And that, that I think, is, is independent of, like, church-state issues. That's where the division is right now. And you can, so National Conservatism held its big conference in Rusty. You, you were there, right? And mm -hmm. I think I wasn't there. Um, Never get invited. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the vibe there was very pro Ron DeSantis. That was what I heard. Maybe that's not true, but that, that, was, that was the word on the street, right? And, like the national conservatives, like, okay, we did Trump, we disrupted, we changed things, but now we need someone who's a little more of a normal Republican who can sort of reintegrate, integrate, re reintegrate the party. The radical, the more radical view is, you know, the next week, compact magazine wrote a piece saying, no, you got to do Trump again, because only Trump will really heighten the contradictions and really, you know, really shake, rattle, and roll the, you know, the liberal, liberal consensus and so on. Anyway, that's enough. That's an, but that's an attempt. The, the, the integralists, as you would expect, tend to be more radical in their views of what kind of politics Catholics and Christians should support. Whereas the natcons and the populists, in the end, are going to come home to a somewhat refitted Republican Party. Also, there's a difference in, if you will, political style. I, I think that um, the, what, what we call the integralist camp or the post-liberal camp, there really is a strong view that there's that there's a um, kind of a conceptual flaw. You know, yep. it's a bad anthropology, John Locke, or it's, it's, it's got the wrong understanding of church state. So we have to kind of repair the political system at the level of DNA. Yeah. Um, whereas I think the net con is more pragmatic, which is we have to make a bad situation better by, what, by you know, not unprincipled means, but what, by, by whatever means are available. Right. And so and there's not that appetite for this kind of quasi-Hegelian diagnosis of of you know why where modernity went wrong or where liberalism went wrong or 
Right, but to stick up for the integralists, right, like it actually is the case that the chief theoretician of national conservatism, the Armazoni, right, yes. is explicitly argues that you know, that he is defending a Protestant and Jewish conception of the nation against Catholic empire, yes, right? Yes, like, yes. And, and this is part, part yeah, of that. I, I find myself thinking that uh, those theories are optional, not obligatory. Right. No, I'm, um, I'm just saying they're, <laughs> but, but they are, but the two are connected, right? If you think that America, you know, America, America is a historically a Protestant country, you're and that's okay, you're going to be more drawn to a sort of Judeo-Protestant nationalism as sort of a sufficient answer to the evils of our time. And if you think that, you know, that Catholicism is better, <laughs> you're going to be like, maybe we went wrong well, we at the had beginning. A good, right? there, was a good, there was a good lecture, a uh, good talk at the, at, the, at the conference, National Conservatism Conference, by Dan Burns, University of Dallas arguing that it is a Protestant nation and that Catholics have to be pragmatic and figure out how to try to achieve the sorts of things Catholics want to achieve in public life within that, right. within yeah. that reality. Typical surrender, man, you know? Right, right, <laughs> no, right. I, 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 right. A, a, I mean, joke. I would say too that um, we're in a kind of confusing time. I mean, there's, there's a kind of coalition of the willing that's more united by what it's against than what it's for, I would say. and. So there's a, they're against, there's a, a growing, the consensus that unites all these disparate groups is that neoliberalism has failed. And that, that was a notion that if we deregulated economic life, especially through the uh, process of globalization, and if we de deregulate culture and give more scope for personal choice, that things will really work out better for everyone. And, and, and that, that hasn't turned out. Um, yeah, that view, I mean, that marriage, view has fallen gay, on hard times. Yeah, I mean, gay marriage was is good for someone who you know is a upper middle class homosexual, but it's but marriage rates have plummeted for you know especially for high school educated Americans. So there seems to have been all kinds of costs to the deregulation process and globalization and the economic transformation of our society has created tremendous wealth. But you know all you need to do is go to uh, California. I mean, it's got the fourth largest GDP in the world. Uh, it's really striking. I mean, their GDP is now approaching Japan's, and there's one third the population in California as compared to Japan. So California is three times richer than the Japan, which we think of as a rich country. Um, so obviously, it, 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 some of those problems are right, but then we, you go to Steubenville, Ohio, and you say, well, but it hasn't worked out. Or the Central Valley of California. I mean, or, you can stay in California yeah, and see Valley. how it hasn't worked and, out. And say, well, yeah, it hasn't worked out. So I think it's that, I think it's that consensus that, um, that, that those promises have turned out to be uh, only half true, if not altogether hollow, that tends to unite these disparate groups for a moment, and then they fall into bitter factional <laughs> debates. Yep, perfect. Hi, um, my name is Mary Kate. Thank you both so much for being here. It's been really interesting. Um, my question is um, something that, you know, I think you both have kind of talked a little bit around, and I'm just curious if we could answer it more directly. I, I personally believe that I think a lot of modern liberals would tell you that the divide between the parties is really about who cares about the poor. And I know that we could all say, um, and I think we all probably believe that that's not necessarily the case. Um, but my question is, you know, when we're talking about like some of the communities here just miles from where we are um, on the south and west sides of the city, um, Barack Obama's message, I think ultimately whether uh, it should have or not, it resonated with them. And so the question for me as an Orthodox Catholic is what should the Catholic the Orthodox Catholic intellectual message mean for those people? Um, and I'm just curious what you both think about that. Yeah, I mean, my, I mean, my, my basic view is that Orthodox Catholicism, you should be somewhat skeptical of the Republican Party's economic vision. Um, 
and <laughs> not, you know, and that doesn't mean, and, 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 I, and I think that that part of the sort of weird intellectual trends that Rusty and I have been batting back and forth here is connected to exactly that reality, right? Which is that, you know, the where, where sort of the um, Republic, you know, I mean, basically the Republican Party has sort of oscillated between a kind of more stringent libertarianism and various attempts to sort of to sort of Catholicize the party, right? Um, so, you know, George W. Bush, while he did not win a lot of votes in the poor neighborhoods of Chicago, did have a sort of specific vision of social uplift that manifested itself in everything from, uh, you know, no child left behind to more funding for faith-based initiatives to the ultimately disastrous but well-intentioned push to uh, you know, have more Americans become home homeowners and build wealth that way, right? Um, and that that was an attempt to sort of that was explicitly influenced by Catholic social teaching to forge a conservatism that was more responsive to some of the some of the problems you're describing. Then that seemed to sort of fall apart, and the Republican Party sort of swung for about five years towards much more of a sort of up by your bootstraps, heroic entrepreneur kind of vision of, of economics that sort of peaked with the Romney-Ryan ticket in 2012. If you, I was at the 2012 GOP convention and you would have thought that the only Americans whose votes mattered were ones who had started a small business in the last 18 months, which since it was not a great economy was really not that many people. Um, but then the pendulum swings back to the point where you know, Trump runs for president not as a candidate pitching himself to, uh, let's say, African American neighborhoods in Chicago, to put it mildly, but as a candidate pitching himself to like any any town in you know sort of this the rural Midwest that used to have a factory and lost it, right? So like going sort of you know swinging in this kind of nationalist protectionist direction, and you know that what the there's sort of two questions, right? The first question is, well, what actual policy mix is good to solve these, you know, both problems of sort of global trade and the complexities thereof, and also the intractable, some of the intractable problems of urban poverty in America? That's one set of questions. But then the, 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 there's sort of a more fundamental question about the orientation of your political coalition? Is it oriented more towards solidarity or more towards liberty? And, you know, uh, this is maybe this gets at sort of this, you know, fundamental tension that Catholics always feel in America because we are a society oriented towards liberty and always have been. And that's part of why our economics are more right wing than the economics of most European countries. Um, but the Catholic tradition is more oriented towards solidarity. And to the extent that you are a Catholic inside a conservative coalition that represents the sort of purest expression of that orientation, that very American orientation towards liberty, your job is in part to try and pull that coalition towards, towards solidarity. And again, what policies that what form poli that policy takes is a separate and distinctive question. Um, but the obligation to sort of, again, if you feel like you have to be in the Republican coalition to be, try and exert a pull towards solidarity, I think is essential. Yeah, I would say also, I mean, the economic factors are obviously important, but we just went through a period of record low unemployment and so uh, the afflictions of the least advantage in our society seem to be far more, far deeper than uh, questions of, of economic uh, redistribution or even reallocation. I mean, I think Chicago, I recently read, spends $29,000 per student in the public school system, which is the highest in the country. And so it's not clear that 
raising taxes and spending more money on education is going to do a, one single bit of good. Um, look, life is very bad for um, many of our fellow citizens. Uh, the bottom third is a very bad third of our society is a very bad place to be. Um, half of the people in our country have zero net worth. Um, and one thing that I tell groups is the society we live in, the culture that shapes the people, that, the society that has been shaped so that 100,000 people die a year from drug overdose death, that hundreds of people are shot in the streets of Chicago, that culture was not created by evangelical pastors in Texas. And it wasn't created by Catholic bishops having an undue influence on American society. This is a society that was created by our liberal elites over the last three generations. And so, I mean, at some point, I hope voters in the city of Chicago wake up and realize that whatever mistakes uh, I'm sure uh, the Republican Party might make, that they at least um, might have a better chance than uh, being ruled by the people they've been ruled for the last three generations. That sounds like a call to action.